Hello and welcome to Well Capitalized. I'm your host, Bobby Kingsbury, Managing Director at MCM Capital Partners. Today I have with me Harry Shimp, Senior Operating Partner at MCM, and we're gonna discuss and define his role, what it is or what it involves post-transaction, what are the reporting requirements, the appropriate cadence after a transaction, and when everything isn't up and to the right, how do private equity firms typically react? would like to start with you providing at least a little bit of, of your background and how you got involved in private equity. Well, Bobby, as, as you know, um, educationally, uh, I'm an engineer, a mechanical engineer, and second time through as an electrical engineer. And uh, following a stint in the Marine Corps, I joined General Electric in uh, the High Temperature Materials Division, which I ended up being the vice president of that division. Um, and left GE in the early 90s, and that's when I first got involved in private equity. And uh, after a couple of years um, in, in the start, one of the companies I was running got acquired by BP out of the UK and uh, ended up being a senior vice president at uh, BP for a while. So uh, with Andover Corporation, our latest acquisition, that'll be the 18th time that I have been a president or a CEO of an organization, uh, and obviously from very large ones and the hundreds of millions of dollars for GE and BP to small ones. So uh, I find uh, working with smaller companies to be more rewarding than, than the larger companies. Uh, there's less political influence on the decision making. It's, it's more about economics. Uh, you find that you can have a direct impact on the performance of the business. You can, you can see the results of your decisions, uh, bad decisions as well as good ones, but, uh, but you get those results right away. So I find that particularly rewarding. And, and frankly, I get to know everybody. Yeah. So there's, there's a personal sort of relationship with, uh, with, with the people that you, know, you don't get when you've got 25,000 people in an organization. You can't know everybody then. Right. So many private equity firms have senior operating partners. Can you explain to the business owners listening exactly what a senior operating partner is, their role, and what they can expect from interacting with a senior operating partner? The role of a senior operating partner tends to be a little different if you're in micro cap versus really large cap. So we're in micro cap, so, so let me stay there. So the senior operating partner is, is the key contact point for the management of the company. And so the financial reporting you know, all automatically goes up to uh, the private equity group. In this case, it you know, goes to the Cleveland office. But in, in issues that are sort of day-to-day -day issues with it, the presidents of the, of the companies that are grappling with, and it can be, um, gee, my medical insurance is going up by 15% this year. You know. Do you guys have any experience in, in trying to hold that down? And gee, what, what would be the norm for vacation policies? Or, oh, I've got to let somebody go. And you know, what do you think about severance? Things like that, uh, of course, those are all people related. Um, putting together a, a long-term strategic plan, which many small companies don't have. Mm -hmm. So you know, how do you view that? And, and in particular, you know, what does a private equity firm look for versus a family-owned firm, for example. You know, what about the timeline differences? So, it's more being a coach, uh, and and really a partner with the president and, and his executive team, than it is being sort of a direct superior. Uh, are there times, you know, when when the operating partner says, "No, you have to do it this way"? Yes, but those those are very rare, and and in fact. Uh, it's not good, really, if, if it gets to that point, right? You, mm -hmm. What you want to make sure is, or not make sure, but what you want to try to get to is the senior operating partner should sort of have a Vulcan mind meld with the president of the company, and they know how each other is thinking. Mm -hmm. So you can explore different avenues, but it shouldn't be a surprise at the end of the day after a conversation, you know, that you both agree on the right path to go on. That, so, but that's how I would describe it. So truly, it. It, it is a marriage, and communication is of Well, the communication yeah, is always key on, on these sorts of things. So you know, the very first thing is understanding 
you know, what the goals are. And, and, and at MCM, we try really, really hard when we put together the deal to align the goals of the executive team with the goals of MCM Capital. And I'm sure you've talked about this, you know, in some other videos, but, you know, we like to make sure that, you know, economically things are aligned. Um, we discuss things like, well, where's the company going to be? And, you know, what, what's the policy for family members in the company? So we try real hard up front, even before, you know, the ink is dry, to make sure people's goals are aligned. Then, the, you know, one of the very first things I need to do with, uh, with the new president is to sit down and say, okay, you know, this is the working environment. This is how we're going to work. So here are the things that, you know, you do by yourself. You don't need to talk to me about. And here are the things that you do, and here are a bunch of things that are in the middle, and if you want to call me, call me. I'm always available to you. And that communication should be an easy two-way flow. You know, there, there shouldn't be any anxiety at the company, you know, if I put a call in or I, you know, I want to come down and visit. And, you know, neither should the president uh, or, or one of his, you know, direct reports feel anxious about calling me. And in, in fact, one of the things I tell people is, you know, good news you can keep for a while. Good news never goes stale. Bad news, I want to know it right away. And, right. and I'm, not to beat up on you, I want to know the bad news so I can help you. That's, yeah. you know, because we have the same goal. Yeah. To your point in, in the answer to, to the last question, you had talked about you know, communication and some things that maybe are appropriate to do on your own versus you know, check with the senior operating partner. Can you provide uh, the business owners listening one or two examples of some things that they should just not worry about, you don't have to talk to the senior operating partner about, and then some of the things that would require your, your attention? Well, well, probably the best way to start with that is setting the budget. So in all private equity environments, but, it, but especially in MCM Capital, setting the budget is really, really important. And it starts, you know, if, if I just talk about it as a calendar year, it starts in sort of the October time frame of the year before. And it's, what do we think about sales? Where are sales going to go next year? Because sales sets the pattern for everything else underneath. So we try to come up with a proposal. We get that in front of the board. Once you get that, you can say, OK, in order to get these sales, what do you need to achieve these sales? This is what you think you can get. Do you need to hire people? Do you need to buy equipment? Do you need to expand your plan? What do you need to do? Mm -hmm. When there's an agreement on the budget, that pretty much, as long as the president is working within that budget that's been agreed by the board, can pretty much call his own shots within the budget. If he needs to go outside of the budget, then you definitely have to come to me. And depending on how far outside of the budget, mm -hmm. you might say, uh, boy, we, you know, we have this great opportunity, but we need another million dollar piece of equipment. Well, that, that needs to go to the board of directors. right? So, but it comes to me first, OK, let's put together a, you know, a plan, and let's justify this to the board of directors. So generally speaking, if you're, if you're looking at sort of you know, levels of authority, matrix, and things like that, so uh, hourly workforce, that is purely within the control of the president of the company. Do you need to hire? Do you need to fire? Do you need to run overtime? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, purchasing of you know, materials to come in and out, you know, raw materials for the business, uh, service items, maintenance items, that's entirely within the, the realm of the president. If you want to hire or fire or change the salary of executives on your team, now you have to come to me. Mm -hmm. And the president can't change his own salary or compensation, and that's, that's pretty obvious. I, I think in terms of people, um, a good rule to follow is one over one. So uh, you know, if, if, you wanna, if you have a vice president working for you and you want to move his salary up or down, or her salary up or down, well, you need one over one approval, so that comes to me. The president's salary, that goes to the board of directors. That, mm -hmm. One over for me, one. one. Yes, one over one. And I try to do that also in the communication thing. So um, I tell the executive team, you should feel free to be able to call me at any time. I said, now, if you do call me, you know, it is proper business etiquette that you should tell the president, you know, hey, I'm going to call Harry, or I called Harry. So you should let him know. The president should not be surprised that you talked to him. And the president shouldn't feel bent out of shape if I put a call to one of his vice presidents. So by the same token, you know, the president can pick up the phone and he can call somebody on the board of directors about something. Mm -hmm. 
And it's proper etiquette for him to say to me, hey, I'm going to put a call through to maybe Bobby's on the board, or maybe Mark Manser's on the board. So the communication ought to be free flowing. And uh, you know the, the key to good communication, the, the number one key is honesty. You, know, you just tell people to the best of your knowledge what it is. So, Got it. And that tends to pay off if everybody has the same goals, right? So not, somebody's not trying to go over this way and somebody else is going that way. Right. So let's, let's stay with communication for, for a bit. So you know, business owners think about selling their business. And one of the things that they I wouldn't say concerned about but are interested in is the level of communication. How often do I need to reach out to the private equity firm? You know, what's, what's the cadence uh, of, of communication? Do I need to, you know, we, what is necessary for me to, to provide the so private equity that, firm? Well, that, that's a really good question. So one is <clears throat> what's required, another is, you know, what do you want to do, right. right? So what's required? Um, if I'm the senior operating partner in a business, there's going to be a weekly call. And the weekly call will involve the president, it will involve his senior financial person, and will probably involve his senior technical person, his senior plant ops person, and his senior sales and marketing person. And those calls are generally on the order of an hour. In fact, I, I stage them one after the other. So I, I don't want them to go over an hour, and, and, they, and they don't. And those calls aren't homework. Those are you no, know, really. In no, and, and, and I'll come back to that. But let me, so, so that's the first thing. And that's pretty much the only thing that the president has to do with me. Now, on a monthly basis, there are monthly financials that are put together, you know, according to GAAP principles. <clears throat> they go to me, they go right up to the Cleveland home office, and then there's a quarterly board meeting. So those are the things that have to be done. Mm -hmm. um, depending on you know where we are with the cycle of the business and 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 how well I you know I really get to know the, the team I'll I'll personally visit you know either you know once every week and a half you know right when we start out there'll be a lot of visits and then it usually tends to tail off you know so if I know somebody really well we've been working together for three or four years you know I might only visit once out of every six weeks Probably by that time, though, in addition to the weekly call, the president's calling me or I'm calling him a couple of times a week, you know, for whatever. You know, it might be that, gee, I bumped into somebody from General Electric blah, blah, blah division, you know, and they could really use some of your products and here's the contact right. number. Or the president might call and say, hey, guess what? You know, I think we might have a really good opportunity on sales. So whatever it is, but that's really a, de a developing thing. Um, getting back to the core of it, though, it, it's really about honesty. No one should really be surprised at a conversation, yeah. you know, where the other person's coming from. And, and those, you know, getting back to the, to the weekly calls, you know, it, it, as a business owner, some might think, you know, I've never had to report to anybody before. Now you're asking ah. me to do this once a week. You know, what's this for? What's the purpose? So the way we start out with this is... I ask the business owner and his team to come up with key performance indicators, KPIs. I, I don't tell them what those KPIs are. I said, but you know, when, when you put together the KPIs, I want you to think about something in the realm of sales and marketing. Come up with some really good indicators for your business. Mm -hmm. Then come up with something with operations. You know, what might that be? Yeah. On-time delivery might be one. Uh, delivery quality is probably going to be one. Maybe overtime is important in that business, maybe not. Um, you know, the financial indicators are, well, you know, is anybody going past 90 days, you know, past due on your receivables? You know, where's your cash or mm -hmm. things like that. But it's up to the president and his team to pick those KPIs. And then we use those in the weekly call to help manage the business. So uh, I try really hard not to force the business into an MCM mold. Yep. What I do want the business to do, though, is I do want them to manage to the K two KPIs of their choosing, but manage to those. So <clears throat> my belief is if you, if you have the right KPIs in place and you manage and track those KPIs, the financial numbers will come. You'll get good results. It's generally not a good idea to try to manage to somebody else's financial numbers that doesn't necessarily track directly to the business performance. Right. 
So if we could take a step back for a minute, kind of getting back to the senior operating partner role. For the business owners that are viewing this, you know, what generally are we looking for? What, what is the senior operating partner looking for in an attractive acquisition? Oh, that's a really good question. So <clears throat> usually when I, uh, when, I talk, <laughs> when, I, when I talk to people at a cocktail party, and you know, that's kind of a frequent question. Now, well, gee, what do you look for when you buy a business? You say, well, I really look for long-term assets, but I'm, I'm not using that phrase in the financial Vinacular. sort of phrase, right? So I'm, I'm talking about it from an operating point of view. So what is a long-term asset? Well, your quality reputation. And that's particularly true, say, in aerospace or medical. If you have a quality reputation, it's taken you a long time to build it. It's going to be with you a long time. Conversely, if you have a poor reputation in one of those industries, it's going to take a really long time to correct that. So that's a long-term asset. A short-term asset might be cash availability. We can fix cash availability when we do the deal. So that's part of the thing that MCM does. You know, well, OK, we've got to structure this. so. Cash availability makes sense. We plan for that up front. So other, other than these long-term assets, we look for attractive industries. Mm -hmm. Attractive meaning, one, we think they're going to grow. And two, that they're not going to roller coaster. So in a world of private equity, it's really tough to manage if you, you know, go through big dips and, and big climbs. Um, we look for, uh, particularly in my field, which is, which is manufacturing, something special. You're bringing something special to the party. So what, what that, might that be? Well, it could be the design of the product. It could be there's something unique about your process that either delivers better quality, faster delivery, better performance. Mm -hmm. um, it might be you have a unique connection to your customer base. You're really, really tied in with these guys. So we're looking for something unique. And, and that is something we really want to protect. So when the deal is done, um, in fact, our, our founding partner used to say, you know, one of the big mantras is, you know, do no harm. And that's, that's still true. You know, don't screw up what got the company where it is today. Don't mess with that. And it, so you have to be you know, very careful if you're going to make a major change, like, you know, well, well, you know, we used to have engineering and manufacturing all together led by one guy and I want to split it apart or I want to split engineering into plant engineering and design engineering and, well, be, be careful with that. Yeah. And if, if you do want to go down that path, make sure that the president and his team really are in agreement. They, you know, they really go, yes, we believe in this, this is the right way to go. But um, it's an asset generally that, uh, that may or have you know, some, some dimensions of the, of the company might not be all that good. But if we can fix them, a short-term asset issue, <coughs> excuse me, could be their financial position. Or it might be, um, gee, you know, we, don't, we don't have very good financial software in place, and we don't really know what our stuff costs. We know at the end of the month whether we make money or lose money, but we don't know which, comp you know, which products do, which products don't. That we can fix. That that we can bring in. You plan for it. You know. You pick the right thing. You put it in. So it's it's interesting. You bring up you know the the do no harm aspect where as many people view private equity, their view of private equity is come in hostile takeovers. We're going to change X, Y, and Z. We're going to cut costs. We're going to fire people. We're going to do A, B, and C. And it's it from from your perspective and being involved in a business. How do you work yourself into the company, ingratiate yourself into the management team, where you have all these outside expectations from employees, from a management team, about what private equity is? Well, first of all, the, you know, as we started this conversation, there's a, there's a difference between big company private equity and small company private equity. Mm -hmm. big, pri big company private equity, uh, and you, you can think back to you know, Richard Gere on Pretty Woman. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they, they do. They split things up and they sell this off and blah, 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 blah. But that's not our world. So we're buying something of value. We're, we're buying a diamond in the rough. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to, or, or, or maybe it's not totally in the rough, but it's not completely polished either. 
but we have the diamond and now we want to make it worth more. That, that's where we're going. I can tell you uh, out of the 18, well, 18 that I've run for all of the private equity ones that were in that, which were 15, I have never sold one. I've never been involved in a sale that we had fewer employees than when we bought it. So. That's great. So from a managerial standpoint, and you know, we've talked in a number of, of different videos too about culture. And you know, culture is both a retention tool and a recruitment tool. And some businesses have a unique culture. A concern generally from business owners is, how do I maintain that culture moving forward when I, after I sell my business? Well, you know, culture is a broad term, and it, and it has many aspects. So as I, as I said, we, we trend by a business that has something unique. It has something of value. To the extent that culture is part of that value, we protect it. Mm -hmm. um, there are other aspects to culture that maybe aren't really appropriate. So very frequently, um, in a, in a small business, um, there isn't any formal process for CapEx, for capital expenditures. Uh, it's just, you know, if the, if the president owner is convinced that it's a good thing to spend money on, you know, he writes a check. Well, it's his mm -hmm. checkbook, he, he writes the check. That doesn't work well in, in, in the private equity world. So there tends to be more of a need for planning for large CapEx expense. Um, same thing with the budget. A lot of people don't, you know, when they're when they're running their own show, it's, well, it'll be what it'll be. You mm -hmm. know, if there's more money in the till, you know, at the end of the month in the beginning, then we've had a successful month. So we tend to push a little bit more into the strategic, I would say, as opposed to purely tactical. Um, so so that's uh, you could say that's a cultural change that we require. But the aspects of culture that have to deal with connection to the customer, um, identity with the product or, or, the, or the process, sort of the feeling you know, in, the, in the whole company that you know, my heart is in my work, to yeah. quote Andrew Carnegie, right? That we protect. So drawing on your unique experience and from a private equity standpoint of an investor, a board member, running businesses for private equity and now being a senior operating partner, what advice could you give to a business owner who is thinking about exiting their business and possibly selling to a private equity firm? Um, I think there are two things you need. I think there are two things that you need to put in front of just price. And, and the very first thing is, you know, what's your goal? What do you as a seller, what, what do you want out of this? Mm -hmm. If all you want to do is, you know, liquidate your position, and, you know, move to Bimini, uh, <laughs> well, then it probably defaults to just price. If there's something else that you want out of this, you want to continue in the business, uh, you want the business to um, grow and flourish and provide employment, then you know you might you might have some you know soft side goals that you want. But whatever those are, you need to get them prioritized in your own head and have that discussion with, with the people that you're selling to. So whatever those goals are. Um, I think the next thing is you need to be comfortable with the personnel. If you're going to stay with the business, you really need to be comfortable with the personalities you're going to be working with. You know, Do you feel like the people at the private equity firm, do you feel like they're honest? Do you feel like they have, you know, your interests at heart? You know, so when they say, "Oh, yeah, we have shared goals," is that what they mean, or are they just saying that, you know, to get the deal done? Yeah. So, you know, that that's a critical part because you're going to be family for six to eight years. So you don't want to be family. You don't want to walk in and have in-laws that are, you know, <laughs> at odds with you all the time. That, that's not a pleasant situation. Yeah, and for most business owners, this is going to happen once in their career, once in their lifetime. For a very select few, it may happen multiple times if they partner with private equity. But if it's going to happen once, 
you want to ensure that not only your, your hard goals, but your soft goals are one met, achieved, and aligned with your potential partner. I, and I, I actually I would say aligned is probably more important than anything else, right? If, if you, sometimes you can't guarantee that they'll be met. You can plan on it, can't guarantee it, but you can certainly guarantee alignment from the get-go. Well, thank you, Harry. Thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. I, I, we appreciate it and look forward to, to the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. you.